this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. We have Melissa Porter as our next presenter. She is a PGY2 Emergency Medicine resident at Denver Health. Today, she is going to be presenting on propafenone versus amiodarone for supraventricular arrhythmias and septic shock. Thanks for that introduction. We'll get started with some background information. So to begin, uh, supraventricular arrhythmias is actually quite a broad term that encompasses atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, and supraventricular tachycardia. All of these arrhythmias occur above the ventricles, and the first two, um, mainly a fib, is what we'll focus on for today, as the majority of the patients in this trial ended up having a fib, which occurs as a result of multiple re-entrant circuits that end up hitting the AV node and result in an irregular rhythm. The incidence of these supraventricular arrhythmias occur at anywhere between 8 to 25% of patients, depending on the studies that have been reported. When we do get a patient with new onset AFib, specifically those that have secondary AFib, so those that are caused by a precipitating factor, the first thing we want to assess is that underlying cause, what factors might be precipitating the AFib event. And these factors could include sepsis, surgery, hemorrhage, MIs, pulmonary embolism, or heart failure with pulmonary edema. And the main thing we want to do initially is to identify these causes and treat these causes. If a patient who is in AFib becomes hemodynamically unstable, which would be altered mental status, a drop in their blood pressure, or some type of cardiac ischemia or decompensation in their heart failure symptoms, we should be considering a synchronized electrical cardioversion for these patients. Moving on to sepsis, as all of the patients in this study do have septic shock, the definition for sepsis is published by the Surviving Sepsis Guidelines, which defines it as a life-threatening organ dysfunction that's caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. And then septic shock is a subset of these patients that should be defined basically by these patients that have profound circulatory or cellular abnormalities that are associated with an increased risk of mortality. And we can identify these patients clinically as those that require a vasopressor in order to maintain their MAPS of 65 or greater, and those that have a serum lactate of uh, greater than two in the absence of hypovolemia. And just of note, while AFib in and of itself can be a precipitating factor, or sorry, uh, while sepsis can be a precipitating factor of AFib, the use of increasing vasopressors will also, uh, is associated with an increase in new onset AFib. Looking at the guidelines, so there are European guidelines that were updated in 2020, Canadian guidelines that were updated in 2020, and um, the American guidelines, which were published in 2014, There was updates, but they don't address secondary AFib management in the updated ones. So these are the last American updated guidelines related to AFib that's caused by an acute illness or secondary cause. So uh, all three of the guidelines recommend managing the underlying condition and correcting for precipitating factors. Uh, They also recommend electrical cardioversion immediately if a patient becomes hemodynamically unstable. What's unclear in these guidelines or conflicting between the guidelines is whether or not we should be rate controlling or rhythm controlling patients who present with new onset AFib in in the setting of an acute illness. So the European guidelines suggest that rate control is preferred, and they specifically mention IV amiodarone as an option. The Canadian guidelines do not make a recommendation outside of the first two. And then the 2014 AHA guidelines make some conflicting statements. So they first say that during acute illness, patients may require rate control. And then later on in the guidelines, they say that recommend that rhythm control may be favored for AFib that is precipitated by an acute illness. They don't define acute illness and they don't provide any uh, data or surrounding information related to these statements. Looking at the two antiarrhythmic agents that are going to be used in this trial, there's propafenone and amiodarone. So propafenone is a class one antiarrhythmic, which is used for its sodium channel blocking properties. And just as a reminder for propafenone, it is contraindicated in heart failure And it does share the U.S. box warning as the same 1C antiarrhythmics like flecainide for mortality in patients with structural heart disease. And that's based off the results of the CAS trial, which while the CAS trial did not use propafenone within it, because it's in the same class as flecainide, it did receive the same boxed warning. 
And then moving over to amiodarone, this is a class three antiarrhythmic. So when used for rhythm control, we're using it for its potassium channel blocking properties, although it does share properties from all four classes of the antiarrhythmics. And just as a reminder for amiodarone, it has been showed to have a delayed effect in terms of converting patients to sinus rhythm when it's used for a cardioversion purpose. And then finally, looking at previous literature, there is not a lot of literature looking at rhythm control, specifically in patients with sepsis or septic shock. However, the authors of the study that we're going to review today did previously publish this retrospective cohort study looking at amiodarone versus propafenone versus metoprolol for supraventricular arrhythmias in septic shock. This was conducted from January of 2013 to December of 2014. And what they found was the large majority of patients in this retrospective study did end up receiving amiodarone. Between the three groups, the, there was a greater percentage of patients who would receive propafenone and metoprolol who ended up converting to sinus rhythm at 24 hours as compared to the amiodarone group. And when they conducted a multivariate survival analysis that corrected for things like age, presser use, baseline SOFA score, and their need for renal replacement therapy, they showed a reduced survival at 12 months for the patients who had received amiodarone for rhythm control as compared to the propafenone and metoprolol groups. So based off the results of this retrospective study, these same authors designed this randomized control trial looking just at propafenone versus amiodarone for supraventricular arrhythmias in septic shock. This was a double-blind prospective randomized control trial that was conducted at two university hospitals in Prague from October 2017 through July of 2022. And they sought to evaluate both the efficacy and safety of IV propafenone as compared to amiodarone in critically ill patients with septic shock. They included patients who were aged 16 to 85 years who met the 2016 Surviving Sepsis Guideline definition for septic shock and who had new onset or paroxysmal supraventricular arrhythmias. They excluded patients who had chronic persistent or permanent AFib. They also excluded patients who had severe LV systolic dysfunction or who had a history of a second or third degree AV block who were dependent on a pacemaker or those patients who had a, a recent maze procedure. They also excluded patients who qualified as having high-dose vasopressor therapy, which they defined as requiring norepi at a dose greater than one mic per kilogram per minute. Patients were randomized to receive either propafenone or amiodarone as a bolus followed by a continuous infusion. Patients would also receive electrical cardioversion if they became hemodynamically unstable, and they also allowed for crossover if at the provider's discretion. The primary outcome was sinus rhythm at 24 hours. And in terms of their power calculation, they calculated that they would require 100 patients in each group to have an 80% power and a p-value of 0.05. And this was based off of that retrospective study that showed conversion rates at 24 hours of 75% in the amiodarone group and 90% in the propafenone group. And they did conduct an intent to treat analysis. So moving on to the results. In terms of baseline characteristics, the majority of these patients had a median age of 70 years and were male. The only baseline characteristic that was statistically significant in terms of its difference between the two groups was BMI, which was greater in the propafenone group. Looking at their baseline illness and severity scores, they had similar scores between the propafenone and the amiodarone group. In terms of the types of arrhythmias that the patients presented with, the large majority presented an AFib, followed by a flutter, and a very small percentage of patients presented with supraventricular tachycardias. And then looking at their presser requirements, the large majority of patients were on norepi, had a median rate of 0.3, roughly in both groups. There were a portion of patients who did receive vasopressin and 11 patients across the whole, both cohorts who received dobutamine. Because these patients are in septic shock, we are looking at the baseline characteristics for their infection. And there was about 66% of patients who were suspected to have a respiratory source of their infection, followed by an abdominal infection. There was also a few patients who were suspected to have a UTI, wound, skin and soft tissue, or neuro infection. Moving over to the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the different antimicrobials that were reported in the supplemental information. And just things to note is that about anywhere from 14 to 20 percent of patients, depending on which group you look at, received a fluoroquinolone. But the large majority of patients looking at that bottom roll at bottom row actually received an antifungal agent. What was not clear from the supplemental information was whether or not a single patient received more than one antimicrobial. But assuming that each of these patients were unique, that would still only sum up to be about 63% of all the patients enrolled in the study did receive some kind of antimicrobial, with the large majority being antifungal agents. 
and then looking at primary and secondary outcomes. So for their primary outcome, which was sinus rhythm at 24 hours, they reported no difference between the two groups. However, when they looked at time to cardioversion, they did see a statistically significant difference in terms of time to cardioversion, with that being longer in the amiodarone group at a median time of 7.3 hours compared to 3.7 hours. In terms of the percentage of patients in each group who ended up requiring electrical cardioversion, it was 40% in the propafenone group and about 32% in the amiodarone group, although this was not uh, found to be different between the two groups. In terms of arrhythmia recurrences, there was about 16.7% of patients who had three or more recurrences in the propafenone group as compared to 38.8% of patients in the amiodarone group, and this was statistically significant in terms of its difference. And then looking at the median ICU length of stay, which was longer in the propafenone group at 16 days compared to 11 days in the amiodarone group. And then finally, looking at long-term outcomes in terms of sinus rhythm at discharge, it was a right around anywhere from 70 to 76% in both groups. And then looking at that rate at one year was largely unchanged in general. And then this was a predefined subgroup that they looked at. So they did a series of echoes on these patients from time from randomization all the way through to 24 hours after they received an antiarrhythmic. And what they found was in patients who had left atrial dilation, so if their end systolic volume in their left atria was greater than or equal to 40 milliliters per meter squared, they did end up seeing this trend toward amiodarone having greater effect in terms of cardioversion as compared to propafenone. So that's the left-hand graph where propafenone is the blue line and amiodarone is the red line. And this is looking at the percentage of patients without cardioversion. And you can see that there were more patients without cardioversion all in that blue line or propafenone. So the authors of this study concluded based off of these results that propafenone was not better for rhythm control at 24 hours in septic shock as compared to amiodarone. They also concluded that propafenone demonstrated an excellent hemodynamic safety profile and that propafenone provided faster cardioversion with fewer, fewer arrhythmia recurrences as compared to amiodarone. So when I was assessing this study, um, looking first at its study design, it is a prospective randomized trial that does seek to answer an important and relevant question. I think this idea of using rhythm control in new onset AFib in septic, septic shock patients is not something that I really thought about before, because I think most of our guidelines still focus so much on treating the underlying cause. But the question of what do we do if a patient is still in AFib despite having treated their sepsis, should we be seeking rhythm control? In terms of their power calculation, just to note, they had expected to see a difference of 15% between the groups, and they only saw 5.5%. So uh, there may be a difference between amiodarone and propafenone in terms of percent of patients in sinus rhythm at 24 hours. This study just wasn't powered to detect that. Moving on to external validity. First thing to note is that IV propafenone is not available in the U.S. and is not available in all countries since the study was conducted in Europe, is available there. That's one thing to note in terms of actually applying I, the use of IV propafenone um, here in the U.S. But more importantly, I think what was interesting was there was no placebo group. And when looking at these patients, since right now I would say the standard of care is to treat the sepsis and kind of hold off on the AFib unless they become hemodynamically unstable. It would have been nice to see a placebo group so to compare the rates of patients, let's say, who just spontaneously cardioverted without any antiarrhythmic, especially because that rate has been reported to be as high as 70% in some cases in the ED. And then uh, it would have been helpful to see the percentage of patients in a placebo group who had long-term outcomes. And what I mean by that is, were they still in AFib at one year? And then the third element of external validity is the sepsis management. And the study was largely unclear. I don't know, based off of the supplemental information I looked through, I don't know the percentage of patients who had source control. I don't have any microbiology data on these patients, so I can't say if their empiric management was appropriate in terms of the antimicrobial options that they received. And then uh, fluid management was not touched on. So I don't know if these patients were appropriately fluid resuscitated. And then the Looking at the percentage of patients who did require electrical cardioversion, the definition for hemodynamic instability was unclear because all of these patients were in septic shock. So they didn't provide any definite definition for when a patient became even more unstable, I guess, for these patients specifically to require electrical cardioversion. And I don't know if that instability was a result of their ongoing AFib or a result of their ongoing sepsis process. 
based off of all of that, the questions that I still have that are unanswered or what are the short-term and long-term clinical outcomes, I think I'm really interested in the mortality as well as the, the persistence of AFib at one year in these patients um, and less interested, I think, in the 24-hour conversion rates to sinus rhythm. So in summary, uh, but what I am taking away from this study is that the conversion to sinus rhythm is definitely delayed with amiodarone as compared to propafenone. The study kind of confirmed what we already know about amiodarone's antirhythmic properties and how long it takes to see those effects. IV propafenone, I think based off of this study, was proven to be safe and effective as an option in AFib management, specifically for those patients without LV dysfunction. And then finally, an area for future research would be when AFib is precipitated by sepsis and when their sepsis is appropriately managed, does treatment with antiarrhythmics improve clinically relevant outcomes if their AFib persists? These are some references and what questions can I answer? If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.